A very good evening, aspirants. As prelims is fast approaching, I have a very good news to share with you all. See, the main step to succeed in the UPSC preparation is to check your progress. For that, you need to attend the mock test. Am I right? Realizing this, the Shankar IAS Academy has come up with the All India Prelims Mock Test, which is completely free for you. And it is held across 13 centers in both online and offline mode. See, there are three All India mock tests that is available in free mode. Note that it is freely available. So, kindly utilize it and check your progress of preparation so that you succeed with bright colors in this UPSC prelims. See, if you ask me the dates for the All India mock test, there are three mock tests. One will be on May 15th. Second will be on May 22nd and the third one will be on May 29th. Friends, kindly make use of this opportunity to analyze your preparation and enrich your preparation with the three mock tests that is completely free. Okay, with this good news, now let's move on to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 9th of May 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that I have chosen for today's discussion. See, in our today's discussion, three articles will be completely based on preliminary perspective and two other articles will be based on both preliminary and mains perspective. Okay? And note that I had discussed a previous year question based on my discussion itself. Then I had also discussed the prelims practice question and today I have a quiz question for you followed by mains practice question. Okay? Now, without wasting much time, let's get into the discussion. Now look at this news article. This is an article from the text and context page. See this article talks about Jammu and Kashmir Delimitation Commission. As you all know, Jammu and Kashmir was reorganized in the year 2019. After this, the Jammu and Kashmir Delimitation Commission was appointed in order to redraw the electoral boundaries in Jammu and Kashmir. See this is as per the mandate set up by the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act 2019. After multiple objections and extensions, the JNK Limitation Commission submitted its final report on May 5, 2022. In its order, the three member panel carved out additional six assembly seats for the Jammu region and one for the Kashmir Valley as per the Act. The Commission's final order has set up the ground for elections in the erstwhile state which last held assembly election in the year 2014. So this is the background of the news article given here. In this context let us quickly go through what is delimitation commission then what is delimitation then we look into the Jammu and Kashmir delimitation commission and some important points mentioned in this article regarding that. Okay. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here for your reference. Kindly go through it. Firstly, what is delimitation? See, delimitation is defined as the act or process of fixing limits or boundaries of territorial constituency in a country or you can say in a province having a legislative body. In the Indian context, if you take the delimitation, it is a process of redrawing boundaries of Lok Sabha and state assembly seats to represent changes in the population. It's only after the completion of this exercise an election can be conducted. Now what exactly is the need for delimitation? See the objective is to have equal representation to equal segments of the population. Also it is to ensure a fair division of geographical areas so that all political parties or candidates contesting elections have a level playing field in terms of number of voters. Talking about the procedure involved, in the normal course of events, the exercise is carried out every few years, which is after the census, to ensure that each seat has approximately an equal number of voters. Okay. See, the Parliament enacts a Delimitation Act under Article 82 of the Indian Constitution. As soon as the commencement of this Act, the central government shall constitute a commission to be called the Delimitation Commission. 
The commission will hold a public hearing after which the final order will be prepared. The final orders are also required to be published in two vernacular newspapers in the state concerned. After the final orders are published, the President of India shall be requested to issue a notification specifying a date from which the said orders shall come into force. See, the copies of those orders no, shall also be laid before the House of the People and the State Legislative Assembly concerned. But here you have to note one thing. No modification shall be permissible in those orders. Okay? The orders of the independent body cannot be questioned before any court. In the past, delimitation commissions were set up in the year 1952, 1963, 1973 and 2002. Now here the important point to note is... See, the delimitation of Lok Sabha seats for Jammu and Kashmir was governed by the Indian constitution. But the delimitation of its assembly seats was governed separately by the Jammu and Kashmir constitution and Jammu and Kashmir Representation of the People's Act 1957. See, this procedure no, was changed after the reorganization in the year 2019. With the enforcement of the JNK Reorganization Act 2019, the central government constituted the JNK Delimitation Commission. Okay. So here comes the question: what is the significance of this Jammu and Kashmir or JNK Delimitation Commission? See, the last time a delimitation exercise was carried out in Jammu and Kashmir was in the year 1995, based on 1981 census. Jammu and Kashmir was under President's rule at that time. There was no census in 1991 in Jammu and Kashmir due to the tense situation in the valley. In the year 2001, the Jammu and Kashmir Assembly passed a law to put the delimitation process on hold up to 2026. Later, the centre set up a delimitation commission in March 2020, which is six months after the state of Jammu and Kashmir was bifurcated and reorganized as the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir and Union Territory of Ladakh. Okay. See, the commission was tasked with delimiting the Assembly and Lok Sabha constituency in the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir based on the 2011 census. And note that it is in accordance with the provisions of the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act 2019 and the Delimitation Act 2020. Okay, the panel was given a year to complete the delimitation plan but was given two extensions. After considering submissions and considering factors like geographical features, communication means, public convenience and contiguity of areas, the delimitation commission released its final report on May 5, 2022. So, what are the key takeaways from this final report? Firstly, the Jammu and Kashmir is split into two divisions, with Jammu having 37 assembly seats and Kashmir having 46. After the commission's final draft, six additional assembly seats were earmarked for Jammu, that is, it was revised to 43, and one for Kashmir, that is, it is revised to 47 seats. The total number of assembly seats in the UT will increase from 83 to 90. The second key takeaway point is the commission has recommended the center to nominate at least two Kashmiri pundits to the legislative assembly. The third takeaway point is the panel has proposed nine seats for the scheduled tribes. These will include six in Jammu that is Budal, Gulabgarh, Rajori, Mendar and Tana Mandi and three in the valley that is Gears, Kangan and Kokarnag. See seven seats have been reserved for the scheduled cars in the Jammu region. The fourth takeaway point is the commission has also recommended that the government consider giving displaced persons from Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir the representation in the assembly and this is to be done through nomination. The fifth point is, in its final order, the commission has noted that it has considered the Jammu and Kashmir region as one 
सिंगल यूनियन टेरिटरी ओके द सिक्स टेक अवे पॉइंट इज दैट द कमीशन हैज सेट इट रीनेम्ड थर्टीन कॉन्स्टिट्यूएंसी वाई हैव दे डन सो दे हैव कंसिडर द पब्लिक सेंटिमेंट इन द रीजन दैट इज वाई दे रीनेम्ड द थर्टीन कॉन्स्टिट्यूएंसी ओके सो द फाइनल ऑर्डर ऑफ द डीलिमिटेशन कमीशन फॉर जम्मू एंड कश्मीर होल्ड अ लॉट ऑफ पोलिटिकल सिग्निफिकेंस The completion of the delimitation exercise will pave the way for assembly elections as this is a crucial step in the possible restoration of statehood for Jammu and Kashmir. Now coming to the point what lies ahead. See the delimitation commission for JNK has issued a notification of its final order in the Gazette of India. As per rules the report has been published in newspapers. The center will now fix a date from which the delimitation order will come into effect. Now that the chief election commissioner has reported that the election commission will then rationalize the polling stations and revise the electoral polls. This will pave the way for much awaited first assembly polls in Jammu and Kashmir after being stripped of its special status in 2019. Okay? So that's all about this news article. So I had made a point to cover the delimitation commission in prelims perspective as well as the mains perspective of the Jammu and Kashmir delimitation commission. See in general in preliminary examination questions may arise based on the static portion which is about the delimitation commission. But when it comes to mains examination in connection with the current affairs you will have a question that is based on the Jammu and Kashmir delimitation commission. So that is why we had covered the article in detail in both prelims as well as mains perspective. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now let us take up this news article. Say it talks about Indian government's financial decisions. According to the author, India is not taking any sound financial decisions. This is noted in the backdrop of government of India's disinvestment from Life Insurance Corporation that is LIC. See LIC is Indian state owned insurance group and investment company. But we know a government is in a hurry to sell a part of its stake in the LIC and raise funds. For this initial public offering route that is IPO route was chosen. We have discussed the IPO process in detail day before yesterday that is on 7th May 2022 Hindu newspaper analysis. Okay? Other than LIC no in recent times we have witnessed disinvestment in many other public sector undertakings as well so author is critical of this move by the government and calling it as an unsound financial decisions see we know many oppose disinvestment saying that it will lead to privatization but here the author is taking a different course according to him government should start investing more rather than disinvesting he even suggests to take lessons from other countries so in this discussion let us have a basic understanding of investment disinvestment its benefits and disadvantages and then we will also see what can we learn from other countries in terms of investments okay before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is given here for your reference please go through it now let's start our discussion basically investment can refer to any mechanism used for generating future income so it involves the conversion of money or cash into assets such assets could be merely certificates or similar documents like the shares or it could exist in a physical form like buildings also in other words the purchase of bonds stocks securities debentures or real estate property etc etc is an investment here the purpose is to firstly as i already said for earning income which is through the way of dividends interest etc see dividends are the sum of money paid regularly by a company to its shareholders out of its profits or and retained earnings okay so through dividend the investor gets her share in profits of the company the second purpose is for capital appreciation here there is increase of investment's value then what is disinvestment see disinvestment involves the conversion of money claims or securities back into money or cash 
So the assets held are converted into money. Overall, disinvestment is the action where the organization or government is selling or liquidating an asset or subsidiary. It is also called as divestment or divesture. So in case of government disinvestment, it typically refers to sale from the government partly or it may also be fully. Okay. And the sale is from a government owned enterprise like public sector units or central public sector enterprises. Okay. Here the basic objective is to put the national resources and assets to optimal use. Particularly to release the productive potential of public sector enterprises. See disinvestment is done for three reasons. It is done as a way to bear losses from a non-performing asset. It is done as a strategic move for the company like exiting a particular industry. Most importantly, it is done for raising resources to meet general or specific needs. Like in case of government, it is done to bridge the government deficit. Now, know that there are primarily three different approaches to disinvestments from government's perspective. First one is minority disinvestment. Here, government retains a majority stake in the company typically greater than 51 percentage. This ensures that management control of the company remains with the government. Here example includes the issue of Power Grid Corporation of India Limited, Rural Electrification Corporation Limited, NTPC Limited, then NHPC Limited, etc. etc. The second type is majority disinvestment in which the government after the disinvestment retains a minority stake in the company. That is, it sells off a majority stake and historically majority disinvestments have been typically made to strategic partners. See these partners could be other central public sector enterprises themselves. For example, merger of Bongayan Refinery and Petrochemicals Limited to IOC, Madras Refineries Limited to IOC, etc. Alternatively, these partners can be private entities also like the sale of modern foods to Hindustan Lever, Balco to Sterlite, etc. Now, the third type is complete privatization. See, it is a form of majority disinvestment wherein 100% control of the company is passed on to a buyer. So, here there is shedding or removal of the ownership or management of a government owned enterprise. Examples include sale of 18 hotel properties of India Tourism Development Corporation. Sometimes disinvestment and privatization are often loosely used interchangeably. But there is a vital difference between the two. It is disinvestment may or may not result in privatization because under minority disinvestment management control of the company remains with the government. Whereas in privatization, there is removal of management control. So, what are the benefits of disinvestment? Firstly, it helps in raising valuable resources for the government. Secondly, the government can focus more on core activities such as infrastructure, defense, education, healthcare, etc. etc. It also results in a leaner government with reduction in the number of ministries and bureaucrats. This can be attributed to the slogan of the current government that is minimum government and maximum governance. Fourthly, it benefits the markets and economy by bringing about greater efficiencies as a whole. Fifthly, it also benefits the taxpayers. This is the case when the current yield on these investment is optimally low. So letting them go serves the long term interest of the taxpayers. Then it benefits the employees too through various means like monetary gains through preferential issues of shares, pay raises, greater opportunities and avenues for career growth. Finally, it benefits the public sector units by providing greater autonomy which leads to higher efficiencies. Even beyond these benefits, there are notable drawbacks. First one is the loss of public interest. See, the public sector units are resources of the nation. They belong to the people. By selling them to private companies, government is seriously affecting people's welfare. The second drawback is, it also instills the fear of foreign control over the divested assets. 
particularly if a company is doing business in natural resources then disinvestment of the company gives the corporate investors control over it okay and the third drawback an important drawback is jobs of lakhs of workers in the public sector units will fall in danger see due to these drawbacks and the fault in basic objective behind this investment other are saying it is a wrong option other believes that disinvesting for raising resources to meet the needs will not solve the problem and india is losing on its ability to invest overseas so if the objective is to raise funds or resources other suggest to focus on government investment especially overseas this is not a vague suggestion but a carefully studied one based on examples of countries like singapore See, Singapore government's investment runs in lakhs of crores of rupees. One of the important major players is the Government of Singapore Investment Corporation, that is GIC. See, it is a private company wholly owned by the Government of Singapore. It is a sovereign wealth fund. See, GIC is a global long-term investor that invests internationally in long term in. equity and equity like assets it does not own the assets rather it acts as a fund manager and looks after singapore's foreign reserves also according to author in the last 20 years the money invested has doubled in real terms currently its total investments amount to about 55 lakh crore it even owns shares in india worth about 1.09 lakh crore so This GIC investment itself is bigger than Indian government's budget expenditure, which stood at 39.45 lakh crore for 2022 to 2023. Here you have to think of this point keenly. Note that the returns or dividends from these investments are used for many purposes, including the public welfare. So, what author wants India to learn from GIC or Singapore? First. to invest funds overseas and that too largely in the financial markets in long term assets like in stock equity according to the author such investments will give more returns than the disinvestment second do not take risky decisions third also make use of wealth management and dividends for revenue generation so overall is the author suggesting to do away with the disinvestment no the smaller and loss making public sector units can be disinvested on the other hand the profitable ones have to be reformed such reformation should definitely include bringing in talent from private sector which can be used for the greater public good understood so that's all about this news article see the types of disinvestment that we study in the discussion will be very much useful for your preliminary preparation whereas the remaining part of the discussion is very much relevant for your mains preparation so make note of all these points and you can straight away use it in your answer writing in mains okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion see this article here this article is with reference to the interview given by retired lieutenant general ds hoda regarding the line of actual control note that He was the former general officer commanding in chief of the Northern Army Command who dealt with both China and Pakistan during a four decade long military career. So in this context let's briefly discuss about the line of actual control and then we will see in brief about the interview okay See line of actual control or LAC is the demarcation that separates India controlled territory from the Chinese controlled territory So you can understand that LAC is going to lie between India and China. Okay. Note that the length of the Sino-Indian border is three thousand four hundred and eighty-eight kilometer. The border traverses the Union Territory of Ladakh, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Sikkim, and Arunachal Pradesh. Then the LAC, in its widest sense, is the effective border between India and China. Note this point. I am repeating it again. It is an effective border between India and China. Okay. It covers the western sector which include UT of Ladakh and middle sector which include Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. It also covers the Meghmohan line in the east which covers Sikkim and Arunachal Pradesh. 
See, India claims that China occupies more than 38,000 square kilometer in the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir in the Ladakh region. This region is known as Shaichin. You can see the disputed area in this image. In the northeast, India recognizes the McMohan line and considers it to be the actual line of control between India and China. But China does not recognize the McMohan line. You can see the McMohan line in this image here. Having seen a background about the LAC or line of actual control, now let's see some takeaway points from the interview of Mr. D.S. Hoda. Firstly, he said India still haven't achieved what it wanted in terms of disengagement and de-escalation in the disputed areas. See, there has been some progress in the areas of hot springs and in the north and south bank of Pangong Su. But in other areas, no, there are no progress. And secondly, regarding the border tensions along LAC, he said the tensions are going to remain and we are going to see a stronger deployment of soldiers along the LAC. There are going to be changes in border management protocols and how we look at LAC management. And thirdly, he said restoring patrolling points must be one of the key elements of our negotiations with China. Okay. Then he said in the past 6-7 years, the CBMs had been slowly diluted. See, CBMs are nothing but confidence building measures. See, the confidence building measures are planned procedures to prevent hostilities, to avert escalation, to reduce military tension and to build mutual trust between the countries. See, there is confidence building measures between India and China, but they are not followed. For example, for patrolling behavior and patrolling patterns, the confidence building measure states that when patrols of both sides come face to face, they should go back after unfurling their banner. That is not happening right now. So it is mandatory to have a new set of confidence building measures. Finally, he mentioned in his interview that there is a great focus on infrastructure development and greater focus on realigning our military capability. This should yield better results. So that's all about this news article. See, we discussed about LAC in prelims perspective and for our mains preparation, we took some of the important points that the former general officer commanding in chief of the northern army mentioned in his interview. See, this point can be either used for your mains or you can use it even in answering your interview based questions. Okay. And since he has more experience, whatever measures he had shared can be quoted in your mains answer and definitely it will enhance your answers. Okay. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. This news article states that Indigo Airlines barred a differently abled child from boarding a flight at the Ranchi airport. So, his parents also decided to not take the flight. When asked about the incident, Indigo said that in view of the safety of passengers, a differently able child could not board the flight with his family on May 7 as the child was in a state of panic. The ground staff waited for him to calm down till the last minute but to no avail. Further, the airline provided them a hotel stay and asked them to fly the next morning. This is the crux of the news article given here. See, we are not going to discuss the issue in detail. We are going to utilize this opportunity to learn about the person with disabilities and the rights of PWD. That is, person with disabilities. Okay. First of all, who are person with disabilities or PWDs? See, according to the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act 2016, person with disability means a person with long-term physical, mental, intellectual or sensory impairment. This hinders his full and effective participation in society equally with others. Okay. Note that this act replaced the Persons with Disabilities, Equal Opportunities, Protection of Rights and Full Participation Act 1995. It fulfills the obligations to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities to which India is a signatory. Now, we will see some important facts about the act and the rights mentioned in the act. See, under the act, the types of disabilities have been increased from existing seven to 21 and the central government will have the power to add more types of disabilities. The act added autism, spectrum disorder, cerebral palsy, 
muscular dystrophy, chronic neurological condition, speech and language disability, then specific learning disability, thalassemia, hemophilia, sickle cell disease, multiple disabilities including deaf, blindness, acid attack victims and Parkinson's diseases which were largely ignored in earlier act. Regarding the rights, responsibility has been cast upon the appropriate governments to take effective measures to ensure that the person with disabilities enjoy their rights equally with others. Secondly, it increases the quantum of reservation for people suffering from disabilities from 3 to 4 percentage in government jobs and from 3 to 5 percentage in higher education institutes. Thirdly, it provides 5 percentage reservation in allocation of land and poverty elevation schemes. Fourthly, the Act provided that every child with benchmark disability between the age group of 6 and 18 years shall have the right to free education. Fifthly, the government funded educational institutions as well as the government recognized institutions will have to provide inclusive education to the children with disabilities. And finally, for strengthening the Prime Minister's Accessible India campaign, stress has been given to ensure accessibility in public buildings. Here when we say public buildings, we mean both government and private buildings. Okay, And it should be done in a prescribed time frame. And note that the Act also provided for penalties for offences committed against persons with disabilities. And it also punishes those who violate the provisions of the new law. Accordingly, any person who violates provisions of the Act or any rule or regulation made under it will be punishable. See, the punishment will be an imprisonment up to 6 months or a fine of rupees 10,000 or both. For any subsequent violation, imprisonment of up to 2 years or a fine of rupees 50,000 to rupees 5 lakh can be awarded or both can be done. Okay, so that's all regarding this news article. See, we chose this topic today because under rights issues, these kind of topics will be covered. And note that rights issues comes under UPSC syllabus. That is why we are discussed about this topic today. And it is relevant for your preliminary examination. You might not believe me. I'll discuss with you a previous year question which I had been asked in the year 2011 prelims, which is completely relevant to this topic. Okay. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. This news article is with reference to the State of the World's Births Report. It is an annual review of the environmental resources that was published on 5th of May this year. Okay. See, the report states that with increasing human footprint, births are undergoing population decline. The report also notes that Humans eat 14% of the world's surviving species of birds. The report indicates that the use of 37% of the surviving bird species as common or exotic pets and 14% as food are examples of direct overexploitation. So in this context, let's learn about the state of India's birds report and also we'll see about this state of world's birds report okay see this topic is very much relevant to your preliminary examination that's why we are taking this news article for today's discussion okay first let's start with the state of india's birds report see the state of india's birds report is the first comprehensive assessment of the distribution range trends in abundance and conservation status for most of the bird species that are regularly occurring in India. See with their universal presence and ecological importance, birds are excellent indicators of the state of our natural world and are potent cultural symbols of nature. So they are coming to say that it is all about India's birds and their status is taken up in this report okay so this national level assessment of birds is a significant step forward in the monitoring and conservation of india's rich and varied biodiversity okay note that this report was carried out by 10 research and conservation organization across india and it was published in the year 2020 See, you can see in this picture itself, what are all the 10 organizations that contributed in making up this report. Okay. 
See, for example, it covers Wetlands International South Asia, then Wildlife Institute of India, and Worldwide Fund for Nature India. Just have a look at these organizations. If at all a statement is asked in such a way, mentioning these organization name, you can easily approach that question. Okay. Now let's see a few important facts from this State of India's Birds Report. Okay. See, according to the report. The number of India's national bird, that is the Indian peafowl or peacock, has increased dramatically over the last 25 years. While if you take the case of vultures and eagles, the numbers have decreased in the country. The study categorized 101 species as high concern, 319 as moderate concern, and 442 species into low concern. See, you need not remember the numbers, but just know that there is a classification like high concern, moderate concern, and low concern in this report. Okay, the groups that show the greatest decline are raptors, migratory shorebirds, and habitat specialists, including white-rumped vulture, Richard's pipit, Indian vulture, large-billed leaf warbler, Pacific golden plover, and curlew sandpiper. Okay. See the report points out that the Indian vultures have experienced catastrophic population declines starting in the early 1990s. The decline are most entirely attributable to inadvertent poisoning by the livestock anti-inflammatory drug, which is nothing but the diclofenac drug. Okay, surveys conducted by the Bombay Natural History Society and Royal Society for the Protection of Birds has shown that. White-rumped vulture has suffered the most severe declines, followed by Indian vulture and Egyptian vulture. Then, coming to bustards, all the four species of bustards in India—that is, the great Indian bustard, Macquins bustard, Lesser florican, and Bengal florican—have suffered continuous population declines. See, the decline is observed due to historical hunting and widespread habitat loss. Also, their slow growth and reproduction contributed to their decline. Okay, see, I had taken only the important species from the India's Birds Report, which can be put into a preliminary question. Even this diclofenac drug, based on that, some question is asked in the preliminary examination. Okay, and note that the species like bustard, vultures. All these are very much relevant to your preliminary examination. So kindly note that their population is declining, and know that what are all the species that is occurring in India. Just be aware of the species name. You need not memorize. Just be aware of it. Okay. Now coming to the state of world's birds report. See this report is Bird Life International's flagship science publication. So you can understand that it is published by Bird Life International. Okay. It also involves scientists from Manchester Metropolitan, Cornell University, the University of Johannesburg, then Pontifical Xavierian University, and Natural Conservation Foundation India. So, what does this report does? See, it reviews changes in avian biodiversity using data from the IUCN's Red List, that is, International Union for Conservation of Nature's Red List. Why do they do so? This is to reveal the changes in fortunes of the globe's 11,000 bird species. The recent report states that nearly 48 percent of existing bird species worldwide are undergoing population decline. Remember, 48 percentage of the existing bird species are undergoing population decline. Okay. And the continued growth of the human footprint on the natural world has led to the degradation and loss of natural habitats, as well as direct over-exploitation of many species. See, when you ask me what are all the threats that are causing this population decline, you can see from this image that was taken from the report showing what are all the threats that are causing the population decline. Here, dark color indicates the threat that causes most of the population decline, whereas light color causes less death when compared to the threats shown in dark color. Okay, for example, take agriculture, which causes more death than dams and water management. Okay, you can observe from this image the color difference, and you can observe that the color difference is to indicate the 
increasing or decreasing order of the threat now coming to the response that has to be taken or that was taken See, during implementation of the 2013 to 2020 bird life strategy, 726 globally threatened species, that is 46 percentage of the species, directly benefited from the work of the bird life partnership. See, these include European turtle dove, Streptopelia. Then a focus for 35 bird life partners. Then 13 species of albatross. See all these no have been benefited from the Bird Life International Marine Program. Then 15 critically endangered species that have been studied by the PhD students are supervised by the Bird Life staff. So we can understand that implementation of the Bird Life Strategy and the cooperation of the countries in implementing the Bird Life Strategy and following the instructions given in the Bird Life programs. will help reducing the threat to the bird species and thereby it results in increasing its population okay so that's all regarding this news article so in this news article we saw about the state of world's birds report and the state of india's birds report and what are all the important points that are mentioned in the report See, so you cannot remember all the species that is mentioned in the report, but you can just be aware of the species that was mentioned frequently in the news article, or those that are getting the status of critically endangered or endangered in the IUCN red list. Okay, just be aware of the species name. That will help you in addressing the preliminary questions. So with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion see the first question is taken from 2011 prelims it is regarding our discussion on rights to person with disabilities act okay see if you had keenly listened to the discussion you can easily arrive at the answer which is option d 1 2 and 3 because statements 1 2 and 3 are talking about the rights of the person with disabilities it is mentioned in the 1995 act and now currently in the 2016 act also these rights are mentioned and today our discussion was based on 2016 act right so you can easily arrive at the answer if you are listen to the discussion carefully here the first statement which says free schooling till the age of 18 years is correct as yes, we saw in our discussion right free schooling is provided for children between the age of 6 to 18 years so that is correct then preferential allotment of land for setting up business yes this is also mentioned in our discussion then ramps in public buildings see not only public buildings even in private buildings also so this statement is also correct so your final answer here is option d 1 2 and 3 now look at this question it is based on our lac discussion See as we discussed option 1 and 2 are correct why because it is what mentioning about the LAC it is a demarcation that separates india control territory from the chinese control territory so it is correct then take option b lac traverses the ut of ladakh himachal pradesh uttar and sikkim and arunachal pradesh that is also correct but when you take option c it is incorrect why china recognizes the mcmohan line is a wrong statement china doesn't recognizes the mcmohan line and it does not consider it to be the actual line of control india only has recognized the mcmohan line and it is considering it to be the actual line of control okay since the question is demanding for not correct statement option c is the correct answer okay now look at the last question it is also regarding our rights of persons with disabilities act 2016 discussion okay it is a two statement question so you have to go through both the statement see the act increase the types of disabilities from 7 to 21 this statement is correct am i right then look at the second statement the disabilities mentioned in the act includes acid attack victims also this statement is also correct this we had mentioned in the discussion itself because in our discussion we saw what are all the new disabilities that had been added in the 2016 act in that this acid attack victims is also added so statement 2 is correct now look at the question it is asking for correct statement so your answer here will be option c both 1 and 2 now displayed here is a quiz question for you it is based on our state of world's bird report okay 
if you had listened to the discussion this question is very easy go through the question and post your answers in the comment section and the correct answer will be posted within 24 hours okay now displayed here are two mains practice question see go through the question and write your answers and post it in the comment section if you like this video do like share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the shankar is academy's youtube channel thank you for listening <laughs>